Okay, so um, so like we said, we'll, we'll just cover off um, some of the major or some of the products, I suppose, around product selection when we're looking forward to growing pastures for the remaining uh, winter period and then into spring um, for grazing, but also for uh, soilage and then hay production. So um, just uh, the, the, first, um, the first slide uh, is just really around some work that Derek Moot did from Professor Derek Moot from uh, University, uh, Lincoln University in New Zealand. And this is when they started to bring water onto the Canterbury Plain. And, um, and so the orange line shows uh, dry land yields over that without irrigation. So they, they spent $10,000 a hectare and they brought in irrigation for the center pivots onto the Canterbury, Canterbury Plains. And they've lifted that six tonne of dry land yield up to, up to 10 um, And that's predominantly in summer and, and, uh, and early autumn um, periods of growth. So not a great return on investment. If you have a look, they then looked at what the nitrogen yield would be. So this is nitrogen yield applied to those dry land pastures. And you can see how nitrogen alone has really influenced um, that, that total dry matter production. And then when water was then added to that um, irrigation system, they could then produce up to 22 tonnes of dry matter per hectare. So what it says is that the main limitation to plant growth is nitrogen. And that's the world over. It's not just on the Canterbury Plains and it's not in just in Australia. Nitrogen is the main, the main mover um, and, and the greatest limitation to, to plant production. So we can get nitrogen from a number of different sources and obviously bag nitrogen is one and that's what we'll be talking to, about today. Uh, and the other production system is, uh, is through leggings in our pasture system. So, uh, so when we're talking about nitrogen, it, it can have really significant in, influences on our overall production. However, there are some rules and some things that we need to consider to make sure that um, we are getting the, the greatest benefit from that nitrogen that we apply. Again, to understand uh, where nitrogen fits into the system, we need to understand the nitrogen cycle. So this is just a, a basic diagram of the nitrogen cycle. We apply nitrogen primarily in the urea form and urea will then convert into ammonium nitrate within a few days. This urea is enzyme in the enzyme in the soil will act on that urea and hydrolyze it. And during that phase of the urea going from the urea phase into ammonium, it can go into an unstable phase of ammonia carbonate. And that can be lost to the atmosphere if we don't have rainfall within a day or two of application. So that, hydro that hydrolysis of that urea occurs quite rapidly. So within one to two days, most of that urea has either converted to ammonia gas or into ammonium nitrogen. And those losses can be significant. And the, when we see some of those losses, and significant, I'm talking up to a maximum of sort of 30% in pasture systems, where we've got higher pH soils, where we've got drying soil, so a moist soil that is drying, light dews or, or misty rain, so you're actually getting that hydrolysis and not enough moisture though to take that nitrogen, that urea granule, move it into the soil to protect it. If you've got windy conditions, it can actually drive that gas off the pasture. If you've got open pasture canopies, so after you've taken a silage cut off the paddock and there's not much residual leaf area there, then a lot of that gas can be pushed off with windy conditions. And obviously in pasture systems, we've got high organic carbon and where we've got those high organic carbon levels, we've got large amounts of urease activity compared to, say, a cropping system. So that urease activity will actually drive that production of ammonia gas a lot quicker in those systems. So we'll talk a little bit about how, um, how, how we can uh, protect some of that, those losses in, in a minute as well. But once you get, uh, once the nitrogen is converted into ammonium, it's quite stable, and then the bacteria take over and they'll convert that ammonium nitrogen through into nitrate nitrogen, and nitrate nitrogen is predominantly the source of nitrogen that plants take up. Nitrate is negatively charged, it's in soil solution, it's in the moisture in the soil, so as the roots take up the moisture, they're taking up nitrate nitrogen. They can take up ammonium nitrogen, but by far and away the greatest amount of nitrogen is taken up is in the nitrate form. And nitrate can also be lost through denitrification, we lose it as gases, uh, or it can also be leached on lighter, sandier soils, or if you've only got shallow rooted pasture species. And coupled into all this, we've got our organic carbon base, which again in pasture systems is quite high, 
that we've got a lot of mineralisation, particularly coming into the spring in the warmer months where you've got moisture and you'll have a large amount of mineralisation coming through uh, and you can also have immobilisation, which is the bacteria acting on leaving a feed source and using nitrogen to actually add that feed source to break down that carbon and, uh, and they'll tie it up temporarily until they die and release it back into the system. So that's our nitrogen cycle. If we actually just take this ammonium to nitrate area, one of the things that influences the rate of um, nitrification is, well, the two things, the moisture and temperature. So in cooler soil temperatures, the nitrification rate is a lot lower uh, or slower than if it is when you've got warmer temperatures. So if our soil temperatures in the middle of winter are five to eight degrees, then it can take four to six weeks for half of that applied urea or ammonium nitrogen to convert into that nitrate nitrogen supply. So if you're in a deficient situation in the middle of winter and you apply a urea source or an ammonium source of nitrogen, it can be you know, a month or a month and a half for half of that applied nitrogen to become available to the plant. Whereas in where the temperatures warm up, uh, that, that period of time that it converts for, to the that it takes to convert from ammonium nitrogen to nitrate is a lot less. So we can have um, so we can in our choice of products use different products to fit into different areas of that nitrogen chain, I suppose. So if we were looking at supplying some nitrogen in the nitrate form to get that plant available nitrogen into the system in cooler soil conditions, there's a couple of options. One, Calgram, which is a blend of um, calcium ammonium nitrate and ammonium sulphate. So a third of that nitrogen is in the nitrate form. Or we could look at a product like EZN, where a quarter of that nitrogen is in that nitrate form compared to the other 75% in the ammonium and the urea form. We can talk about um, we'll talk about green urea as well, which is uh, is in the urea form. It's just a coating that protects against this urease activity to reduce your losses of through volatilisation. And we'll also talk about these um, the pasture boosters and green top as well, which uh, most of the nitrogen in those booster forms is either in the urea or the ammonium form. So looking at that nitrogen cycle and understanding how plants take up nitrogen and the nitrogen cycle and how slow or quickly it converts through into the different stages of nitrogen, uh, we can then assign some different products to it to, um, to look at getting the best benefit from our products. So with nitrogen, uh, there's just some key rules. The first rule is that um, what we use it for is pretty much to produce additional dry matter over our normal growth rates. So you can see from that work that Derek Moot had did on the Canterbury Plains uh, that the nitrogen has a huge response to, um, or applying nitrogen has a huge response to dry matter. And essentially we're in increasing the, the leaf size or the plant size. And we describe that response as kilograms of dry matter for every kilogram of nitrogen that we've applied. And we'll do some numbers in a second. Uh, we only apply that additional feed when, or that additional nitrogen when we can consume or conserve that, that feed. Otherwise, it becomes expensive. Uh, and, that, and if we, we want to be getting that nitrogen on immediately post-grazing or in a silage situation, as soon as we've cut that silage, getting the nitrogen on straight away and into the soil. For every day that we delay that that application, um, the yield response will be decreased by one percent. But so that nitrogen response will be de decreased by one percent per day. So when we're thinking about nitrogen, it's got to be forward. It's no use just thinking we're out of feed now and we need to get some nitrogen on. If we're calving cows in another, or we're calving cows at the moment then we should have been thinking six weeks ago about getting nitrogen on and having that feed uh, and getting that ma maximum response to that nitrogen applied. And the same as if we're looking at silage in the next few months, we've got to be looking at locking it up and allowing at least four weeks to get that nitrogen response through. There's a number of different things that will uh, affect how much of a response you get to nitrogen, whether that's a 10 kilogram at this time of year response to nitrogen, or whether it's a 15 kilogram, or whether it's a 20 kilogram of dry matter for every kilogram of nitrogen. Uh, and that can be residual soil nitrogen, so how much soil is left in the soil, mineralisation rates, so at the moment they're slower, but they'll be increasing over the next few months as the temperature's warm. Species and cultivars, they all respond differently to nitrogen. Grazing management is really important to make sure that we're allowing that full leaf expression to get the maximum benefit of the dry matter in that rotation. 
Soil moisture is absolutely critical. It's the most important. If we haven't got soil moisture, then we're not going to be getting a nitrogen response. Status of other nutrients, and we'll talk about them in a little bit more detail in a second, and also obviously day length and temperature. As our day length and temperature increase and our growth rates increase, so do our answers to nitrogen. This is the work from the Mount Lofty Ranges done by uh, or undertaken by Elliot and Abbott in 2003, but uh, it just highlights, I suppose, when we're talking about rates of nitrogen application, where we're targeting those rates. So less than um, 25 kilos, we can get no response to nitrogen or minimal responses to nitrogen. And over 60 kilos of nitrogen or 50 to 60 kilos, we also see a law of diminishing returns. Or, or, and, for, and potentially financial returns to that nitrogen applied. So we really want to be applying somewhere between 25 and 60 kilograms of nitrogen in each application. Uh, there is this area here that we can apply greater rates, and that we can look at applying rates of up to 80 kilograms of nitrogen in certain situations. And if we've got really good base fertility, the season's going with us, we've got good moisture, um, and we've got low mineral nitrogen levels, so we potentially we've taken a lot of nitrogen out of the system, as in, say, a, a silage cut, then if we, we can actually push some of these rates of nitrogen a little bit harder to get a greater response and grow more dry matter in silage or hay um, in, that, in that period of time. So this is some, some work that was done down at, uh, in Hamilton uh, a couple of years ago, and it just shows a nitrogen response from zero nitrogen applied up to 120 kilos applied and we maximise the yield at about 60 to 90 kilograms of nitrogen in each cut. So this was a cut that was from the 14th of July to the 14th of August, and you can see what's, what it's done as far as increasing nitrogen rate with respect to increasing the leaf size and the plant size. And when we get maximum responses to nitrogen or maximum dry matter responses, ryegrass needs to be at about 3 3.5% in, and that's when we're going to be maximising the amount of dry matter that we're getting in the system. So if we take this example and we said that we've applied um, 60 kilograms of nitrogen and we've got 11 kilograms of dry matter for every kilogram of them, we can crunch the numbers just to see what that cost of feed is uh, compared to buying alternative hay or silage or grain in. So if we use urea at $600 a tonne spread, $1.30 a kilogram of N, and in this cut, in this particular cut, we applied 60 kilos of N, and the response from the trial was that we got 11 kilograms of dry matter. So it's pretty much 60 kilos of N by 11 kilos of dry matter, so we grew an extra 660 kilograms of dry matter over our normal base rate, so the zero, we grew an extra 660 kilos over the zero. So that works out at about $78 a hectare or $118 a tonne of dry matter. So you can just quickly do some calculations as to see whether or not um, the economics stack up for, for nitrogen at certain times of the year in certain situations. So just to summarise nitrogen, we nitrogen rules, 25 minimum, 60 maximum. We can go higher in certain situations, particularly if we have removed one or two silage cuts. Um, that, there's, there's some real opportunities there on driving nitrogen rates a little bit harder. Um, just remembering that we've got other rules around that as well, making sure that we've got variety and, and, and fertility. Uh, adequate soil moisture is, uh, is absolutely key. Uh, we need at least 50 mils of stored moisture to get a response to nitrogen. And again, I've said it before in uh, a few times, but 2015, where our spring cutout was a classic year for those who applied nitrogen early, where you still had soil moisture, they got really good responses compared to waiting a little bit longer. And the Bureau are still talking about a dryish spring. So uh, if things do dry out in the next, um, next six weeks, uh, getting nitrogen on early and using that moisture while you've got, uh, while you've got it is, is, a, is, a key, um, is a key aspect, I think, to uh, making sure that we maximise our dry matter response. We want at least five mil of rain to take that urea into the soil and lock it away from palatalisation losses. And we need that within a couple of days of application. We need good base fertility to get that response, that, that dry matter response to nitrogen. Understand our local and regional dry matter growth rates. Understand our seasonal dry matter variations between species and cultivars. So again, knowing what you're growing and how it can grow and how much it can grow. And uh, if we're grazing, really getting that leaf emergence uh, under control. So at, coming into spring, we're looking at canopy closure. 
Um, but if you're sort of late winter still, we, we want to be probably getting around that two and a half to three leaf stage with ryegrass to make sure that we've maximised our, um, our dry matter um, response to that nitrogen. And with uh, when we're talking about silage or hay lockup, we want at least four weeks minimum lockup period. There's two reasons for that. One is that if we if we graze or sorry if we if we cut it before four weeks, we're not getting our maximum response to that applied nitrogen. We haven't let the, the expression of dry matter accumulation occur enough. And the other reason is we've uh, we've increased the buffering capacity. So the whole thing about ensiling is to drop the pH with the uh, with the activity of lactic acid. So if we've got too high a nitrogen content content in the in the uh, in the, in the silage, uh, what happens is that uh, that buffering content or the buffering capacity will be higher, and therefore we won't get the acidic effect of that um, that silage, which then causes the fermentation of the um, water soluble carbohydrate. So we need at least four weeks lock up for silage and hay. So just to talk a little bit about some of the products. Green urea is, an, is, uh, is a product that we use to reduce lateralisation losses. Um, this is just normal urea on the left and green urea, which has a slight green tinge to it. That's uh, Green urea is applied at two litres per tonne of urea. It costs around that $50 to $60 a tonne extra. Uh, and we use this formulation of MBT, which is MBPT, which is... Um, N biophosphoric triamide, and uh, and that's applied to the urea at dispatch, so it pr protects those losses by up to 70%. So most researchers are saying that we lose somewhere between uh, 20 and 30% of applied nitrogen in pasture systems, or we can lose 20 to 30%. And you can see that most of those losses in this graph from uh, Helen Suter, that most of that urea that's applied at day zero is lost within two days of application. So that's why we've got to have either uh, that protected through a product like green urea or we've got to have that application or that rainfall event, sorry, within a couple of days of application uh, to make sure that we've got that locked away. And as I said, otherwise you'd potentially run the risk of losing up to 30%, particularly if you've taken that silage cut off and you're reapplying nitrogen, then you can, in those open swards where you've got wind pushing that, um, that, that gas off, can be quite high. So if you apply it with green urea and the on boosters as well, you can use it on boosters. Uh, you can protect it, uh, protect those losses by 70%. And one of the reasons we get these losses is that uh, urea has quite a high pH. It's a pH of about nine, nine and a half. So you get this localised alkalinity, which is represented by these darker areas. And over time, that as that urea granule hydrolyzes, takes on water, it'll buffer back to the soil pH around it. So where we've got pH in a interchange of over eight, it'll tend to go to ammonia gas, and if it's less than eight, it'll tend to go to ammonium nitrogen, which is safe. So green urea buys you time to uh, to stop those, or allows it time to actually buffer back to a lower pH and uh, and reduce some of those losses. That's essentially how it works. Another product that's uh, another straight nitrogen product that is potentially uh, uh, at your fingertips to use is a product like EZN. So EZN has a lower pH, it's a pH of 6 to 7, so you don't get that localised alkalinity like you do with urea. Uh, and it's typically sprayed on the pasture as well, so you've got um, a, a much even distribution of nitrogen across, that, that, um, across your pasture and you don't get these localised areas of alkalinity like with urea. So EZN has 50% of the nitrogen as urea and the other 50% is either ammonium nitrogen or nitrate nitrogen. So you get that quicker plant uptake with that nitrate nitrogen. And we tend not to see ammonium nitrogen and nitrate nitrogen on acid soils and lateralise off to the atmosphere. So a lot of the work that's been done by researchers suggests that um, green, no, sorry, EZN compared to urea is about 50% of the lateralisation losses, which makes sense looking at that uh, at that data. And EZN's great coming into the uh, into the irrigation season, either putting it through the water um, because the water's going where the roots are going to be, or the roots are where the water's going to be. So if you're putting your nitrogen with it, you'll get uh, great uptake of that that nitrogen. You can put it out through a boom spray application. Again, the, the spread or the, um, the each nozzle should be 
uh, have less than you know five percent variation across the boom, so you get a very even application across the boom width, and you can also apply certain chemicals and also pro jib with EDM, so you're getting uh, you're getting a dual benefit uh, in one pass. Uh, you can store the product indefinitely, uh, so if you don't need to use it this year, then it'll it'll store. And by far and away, the best way to handle EDM is in bulk. So if you can buy a an 18,000 litre load, which is equivalent to 18 tonnes, stored in a tank, it'll store indefinitely and it's a very clean and easy way to actually take nitrogen out and use it when you need to use it and mix it with uh, with certain chemicals. One of the, um, I suppose, things just to watch with applying EZN is burn. So you can get some burn. This is applied at 100 litres meat of EZN on some uh, premier ryegrass pastures. You can see some tipping there with the uh, ryegrass and also some uh, margin burn on the on the clovers, which tend to be a little bit more sensitive than, uh, than the ryegrass. So it's just, uh, but if you've grazed the paddock and you've got, haven't got much residual uh, leaf area there, then applying nitrogen at that time is obviously the most efficient time to apply it. Uh, and also you haven't got much leaf to burn. And then you come back sort of a couple of weeks later and, uh, and that, that burn sort of growing through. Okay, so that their straight nitrogen products, our green urea for the lateralisation, minimising the lateralisation losses, and easy end to, um, to put ProGib out and also getting that fast application of nitrate. We've also got these uh, other products that we can put in as far as phosphorus and potassium and sulphur. So one of the things we need to consider when we start to talk about introducing other nutrients into the spring and late winter applications of fertilisers is that is that, is that nutrient a cost? or is it actually an investment? And so most people consider fertiliser as a cost. I, can, I consider it more of it as an investment because if you're not getting a return on that night, any, on those dollars that you're spending on that particular nutrient, then it will be a cost to the business. And so we can look at what the costs of different nutrients are. So nitrogen about $1.30, phosphorus about um, $2.60, potassium about $1.30, and sulphur about um, $1.10 per kilogram of nutrient. So with that in mind, we can then look and say, okay, well, do I need phosphorus to go out with my nitrogen for my spring campaign? And the first thing to consider, there's, there's three things to consider. The first one is where you sit as far as the, the critical values in a particular um, pasture situation. So if you're in a beef sheep situation, you might be looking at, say, 90 to 95% of maximum yield. And in that case, if we looked at Olsen peas, we'd need an Olsen P range of somewhere between 9 and 14 to get 90 to 95% of maximum yield. Or if you're aiming for a higher yield in your particular pasture, you'd be aiming for a higher phosphorus value. And these are the numbers here if you're using PBIs. We, I'm sorry, if we're using um, coal wool peas, we'd need to take into account the PBIs or the soil texture of the soil as well. And they're the critical ranges that you'd be looking at. So the first thing is... Do I need phosphorus with my blend? It's either uh, yes or no. Uh, if you had really high phosphorus values in your soil, it was close to the dairy, and there was a, you know your, your olds and peas were 40s or 50s or something, well, obviously you wouldn't be putting phosphorus out because you've got plenty to mine. So do you need it or not? Um, the second point is, do you need to look at your capital? So um, did are your phosphorus levels really deficient? And in that case, you might need to supplement any autumn application with a spring application. And to actually raise the value of your Olsen P or your coal P value in the soil, you will need to apply some capital phosphorus into the system. So this table that Cameron Goulet put together just shows that so for a sandy clay loam with a PBI of 100 to 300, you would need to apply nine kilograms of phosphorus, so essentially 100 kilograms of single super or superfect, to raise your Olsen P by one. Or if we were talking about coal P, we'd need to be applying 2.5 kilos of phosphorus to lift our coal P by one. So you can do some numbers and say, okay, I'm below where I need to be, and therefore I might choose a blend that has a higher phosphorus, phosphorus concentration to pump up, um, to supplement my capital build of phosphorus over the season. And the third thing that we need to consider is removal. So are, am I cutting, am I returning it through grazing or am I cutting it for silage? Am I doing one or two cuts? What are my yields? And am I also doing a hay cut on a particular paddy? So this is just a table that shows uh, how, many, how many kilograms of nutrients are removed for, say, a loosen, a grass clover a hay crop or a grass clover silage cut. Um, the numbers... In, without the brackets, represent how many kilograms per tonne removed, 
And I've just said, OK, well, if it's a three tonne yield, what would that represent as far as how many nutrients are removed? So in this particular case, when we look at phosphorus, for a loosened hay crop, if we're removing three tonne yield, we're taking off six kilos of pea. So our strategy may be, if, if our Olsen P values are in the satisfactory zone, we may be just looking at putting a blend out that is going to satisfy the replacement of the, the, the phosphorus that we're removing from that hay or silage cut. So, uh, so that's looking at phosphorus. With potassium, same sort of story. These are our critical rates, and the critical levels will depend on the soil texture. So the heavier the soil texture, the higher the critical value. So are you in those critical ranges or not? If you are below, then you'll need to look at applying some capital to get, get your higher rates of potassium out there. Uh, but if you're actually in excess of where you need to be, then potentially you could reduce or drop out potassium in, in your system. The, the, as the soil takes up potassium, or sorry, as the plants take up potassium from the soil, uh, the soil will continually give up more potassium to re-reach that equilibrium that it tries to set. And grasses uh, or legumes are more responsive to potassium than grasses. So grasses have a better root structure, a better root system that can actually forage and pick up potassium than what a legume can. Uh, a clover in particular uh, loosens not so bad. So if you've got a lot of uh, legumes in the system, then they'll respond a lot more to potassium than, say, what a grass will. But we've got to remember, even if we are in the, the satisfactory zone for potassium, that it, it, there is peak demand on potassium uptake during spring. We've got growth rates in excess of 100 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day. And with those significant growth rates, we're also taking up anywhere from, you know, say 2% potassium, 2 to 3% potassium in that plant. So we're removing up to 2 to 3 kilograms of potassium per hectare per day. So that's a big draw on the soil. And, uh, and so supplementing some potassium into the system uh, can potentially help in maximising yields in the spring peak growth periods. And again, talking to Derek Moot, uh, you know, in, in Lucen, in spring, key spring growth period, uh, they're finding even where they've got adequate potassium levels in spring on, on Lucen, they're finding responses to potassium just because of that huge drawdown on potassium at that time of year. So it can influence dry matter production. And the other thing to remember is that there is a relationship between root mass and potassium uptake. Where you've got a greater root mass, which tends to be in the top 10 centimetres of your soil, you're going to have a greater potassium uptake. So again, you can have increasing potassium levels down the profile, or there may be decreasing potassium levels down the profile. And the root structure and the profile of that root, um, root structure down the profile will indicate whether or not it, how much of that potassium it actually has access to. So where the root mass is, there'll be greater uptake and greater reliance on the potassium source. And again, the third component of looking at potassium, whether you need it in a blend or not, is to look at removal. And potassium, there is huge removal from potassium um, in silage and, and, and hay cuts. So in, if we're looking at our three tonne yields, we're looking at removal of uh, you know up to 70 or 80 kilograms for a three tonne silage or hay cut which is quite significant, and that potassium has obviously got to come from somewhere, uh, and the soil will give it up. It'll come from organic carbon, um, but potentially you may need to supplement some potassium in by knowing whether or not you're in the critical range of, uh, of your potassium levels on the soil. And then sulphur, the final nutrient that just to discuss at, at the moment when we talk about applying some of these um, nutrients to the soil. Uh, again, these are our critical values. We want to be in the top 10 centimetres, somewhere between 8 and 10. Uh, to reach you know, that 95 to 98% of maximum production. The legume content will be primarily driven by, um, if, if, you've got, sorry, if you've got reasonable clover content in the soil, that is going to have uh, a, a greater draw on, on sulphur than, uh, than grasses. Did you apply a perfect a sulphur-based product in the spring or not? If you didn't and you just went with a high analysis product, then potentially you may need to supplement some sulphur to cycle it through the system in the spring. As a rough rule of thumb, the annual maintenance is somewhere around 12 kilos of S per hectare per year, and uh, and most of that sulphur cycles through the organic carbon. So in partial systems, we tend to have pretty good organic carbon and fairly good sulphur cycling, but we can leach it in lighter soils and particularly in higher rainfall zones. So it is um, it is important, and we do have um, removal along the lines of 
for the removal of phosphorus. Around that, you know, two two kilos per ton of uh, of dry matter being removed. So we are, if we are removing it, we have to consider putting some back in as well. So to look at a product uh, that may fit the bill from um, a spring application, then we need we can look at the boosters, boosters or green top type products where we've got nitrogen, a, a phosphorus, a potassium and a sulphur all within different ratios. And the way we work out how much we need to put on of any of these products, we go back to the story around nitrogen rates, we go back to the story around do we need phosphorus, potassium and sulphur and how much do we need, what are we trying to achieve, how much are we removing. But primarily we set the application rates, number one, based on nitrogen. Remember that we wanted to go at least 25 kilos of nitrogen per application up to a maximum of 60. We can push it harder up to 80 in certain situations. So nitrogen will set our rate initially, followed by, um, followed by um, uh, potassium. We don't want to be exceeding about 60 kilograms of potassium in each application from either a luxury uptake point of view, so the plants can consume more than what they need and therefore you'll be removing more potassium, but more importantly from an animal health issue, we only want to be putting out 60 kilos in any application. So we set our rates on this, so for a pasture booster we would look at that from anywhere from 125 up to say, you know, you could put that out at 300 kilos to the hectare and that would be giving you, you know, up to um, close to 80 kilos of nitrogen at 300, it would be giving you sort of 9 or 10 of phosphorus and that would be giving you around that 40 kilos of K. So um, that would be a reasonable price to put out at that rate. Whereas say a fodder booster, or say a hay booster, we'd only be looking at putting that out at say 200, 220 because we'd be going with the lower end of the nitrogen rate but the top end of the potassium rate. Uh, and then but yeah, just, just keep in mind, I suppose, so we look at the nitrogen first and then the capital. So do we need to put in at any P and K as a capital and then understand how much do we need for our maintenance? And just as a, a rough rule of thumb, if you just worked on 25, 2, 25, 2, so 25 of nitrogen, 2 of phosphorus, 25 of potassium, 2 of sulphur, for every tonne of dry matter, uh, you can have some rough numbers as far as what you need for removal or maintenance from removal of hay and silage. Most people would have seen this work from Cameron Goulet, but this, the red areas just show the accumulation of potassium across a dairy farm. So the darker colours, the redder areas are where the, you know, the dairy's down here. So we've got high potassium levels. So understand that we're not going to be needing to put potassium on those areas. It would be more of a straight and nitrogen product than, um, and maybe some sulphur, but um, probably not phosphorus or potassium. Whereas out here at the back country where, we're, where we continually remove uh, a lot of P and K um, through silage and hay, then that's where we may need to really focus on uh, on that drawdown. So again, just looking at a dairy farm here, out the back here was where we may need to, you know, where we're pulling off a lot of that hay and silage. So that's where we might look at a hay booster and a fodder booster. Closer to the dairy where we need just a bit more of a balance between um, phosphorus and potassium, just a little bit of a maintenance top up because the cows do frequent here and do deposit some potassium and phosphorus in there, then a pasture booster may be a better product. Whereas closer to the dairy where we've got high P and high K levels, then a grass booster or just a straight urea or a green urea may be, uh, may be the best bet. So the final product I just wanted to touch on this morning was Calgran. So Calgran is, uh, is, a, is a blend of both ammonium sulphate, Granam, which is 22% um, 20 nitrogen and 24% sulphur. So all that nitrogen is as ammonium nitrogen. Uh, and also a blend with cal -Am, which is calcium ammonium nitrate. Now, cal -Am is a security-sensitive ammonium nitrate, so you need handling and transport. There are handling and transport restrictions about that product. So what we've done is we've blended both of those products to bring it in as a blend of cal -Gram, uh, so that you have the benefits of some nitrate nitrogen with the ammonium nitrogen, but it takes away the security-sensitive uh, component of that, that product. So the benefit of having a cal grand blend is that, uh, that you can have that, that nitrate, nitrate, nit nitrate nitrogen, as I said. And again, there's a range of different products. Again, it's nitrate nitrogen for when the soil conditions are cold uh, and that response to that nitrate nitrogen is going to be quicker. You can look at uh, applying them in the late winter and early spring. So we've got a range of different blends, the same as what we've got for the boosters, where we've got either straight nitrogen, sulphur products, 
all we've got, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium um, ratios of, that, that hopefully fit most bills uh, that, that may be needed. So one of the, a couple of the key ones would be Calgram, is, a, is quite a product, a common product, and also Calgram Aftergraze, which, um, which was an old product that we used to sell uh, as nitram or ammonium nitrate as well, but uh, it's a Calgram blend now. So, uh, And then yeah, there's, there's a range of different products that uh, could be used across the, across the property. So the same rules, of, we set our nitrogen rates first and then we look at our P and our K as to whether we, we need to apply it. And remember, again, whether how much phosphorus or potassium or sulphur we're applying, they come at a cost, but we've just got to make sure that we're, uh, we're putting them in situations that are going to give us a return on that investment that we're putting in. So understand those, those issues that I spoke about before. So the benefits of Kel-Gran, uh, which is the blend of Kel-Am and Gran-Am, Less prone to volatilisation uh, because we've got that ammonium and nitrate components there. It's quicker response with that nitrate nitrogen in the cooler temperatures, as we spoke about earlier. Uh, it contains sulphur, calcium, and all, uh, all uh, and potassium as well if you need it, and phosphorus. So there's a, there's a range of different blends. You don't have to worry about the security sensitive uh, component anymore because it's a blend. It maintains the soil pH compared to other nitrogenous fertilisers. It's less acidifying. But one of the things with the product is that it does have a low relative critical humidity, which means when we get uh, when we get atmospheric humidity, then this product can take on some of that moisture and set hard. So it wouldn't be recommended to be stored for extended periods. Just sort of get it and use it within um, within a shorter period of time. So I just wanted to show you this uh, this graph here. This is just the effect of. Um, different nitrogen products on the acidifying or their acidifying effect on the soil. So you can see something, so what it says is this is how many kilograms or, or the, the amount of lime that's required to compensate the acidifying effect of a particular nitrogen fertiliser. So if we took cal which is a security sensitive ammonium nitrate, uh, it would take 30 kilograms of lime to neutralise that nitrogen product in the soil, uh, something like urea or EVM, it's about 82 kilos of lime um, for per 100 kilos uh, of, of product, whereas if we get this cal blend, it's around 67. So there's, uh, it's less acidifying and you need less lime to neutralise that effect of that, um, that acidifying effect on the soil. So it's just another advantage of a product like the cal blends. So to summarise, uh, understand the nitrogen cycle when you're when you're coming up with your plans for um, for the spring, late winter and spring applications. Uh, it's really important to understand how plants take up nitrogen and also where the loss pathways are and where the the sources of nitrogen come into the system. Uh, the other thing is really having a look at at our rates. Understand we want to be putting on at least 25 and maybe up to 60. And in certain instances, we can push it a little bit harder, uh, up to 80 kilos. So understand the rates and the responses that we're going to get. Understand the different cultivars and species and seasonal growth habits by region. So what sort of response are you going to get to the particular species or cultivar that you've got in the paddock? And, uh, and that will dictate your, um, your financial um, benefit, I suppose, or reward that comes back from that. Uh, understand that you need to have a good base fertility but you also can supply some nutrients from these applications in the spring and look at pasture density and also composition as to um, what products you may need, so whether you need potassium or phosphorus in there as well. Grazing management and timing of fodder conservation is really important. Allow that four weeks or that canopy closure if you're looking at grazing or four weeks at least before you get it in silage or you cut it for hay. Uh, and the main issue is moisture. So, you know, if we don't want to be like this guy over here who's only got a quarter of a pot left, uh, he's not going to get much of a nitrogen response. We want to have at least 50 mil of stored moisture in the soil to get a good response. And if we are irrigating, make sure that we don't um, stress the plants, keep on top of the irrigation scheduling so that we're not running into uh, any moisture deficits that actually check dry matter growth uh, in, in that spring period. <laughs> 